Y'all mind if I... <laughs> <laughs> you piece of shit, FromSoft. FromSoft kind of made me look like a dumbass, and I'm a bit offended because I usually do a good enough job at that by myself. I think I'm the last person that needs any help with that. It seems like whenever a particular weapon skill or magic spell is OP, nothing ever really happens outside of just stuffing its damage and calling it a day. I think the Moonveil would have been fine if you just turned down the range on the Stance Star 2 a bit and made the windup more obvious for PvP, but instead they went full nuclear and now it's one of the shittiest weapons in the game. Maybe if you got rid of that yee yee ass katana, you'd get some maiden on your dick. If you follow the link in the description and use code RUSTY, your single ass can get 15% off of anything you purchase, including this limited edition maidenless hat so you can trumpet your marital status to the heavens. Number 10, the Meteoric Ore Blade. A katana that actually scales with strength. That's... That's kind of weird, but I'm into it. Despite this weapon residing in the innermost rectum of Kaelid, you can snag this one from the very beginning by taking the transporter trap and just heading over to Kaelid Waypoint Ruins. It's said to resemble the impact of a crashing meteor, so I can't really take this weapon too seriously, because reading the description makes it sound like I'm being sold something, but its heavy attack is straight off the Sekiro ability tree if that does anything for you. It's worth noting on the description that it's used to dispatch life forms born of falling stars, but in case that isn't obvious enough, they throw in a gravity spell with no extra charge just to make sure you know who to go after. I get a very twisted joy using Gravitas with this weapon because using it to cancel the attacks of dude three times bigger than you is actually a pretty rock solid strategy. You get a huge poise boost when you activate it, I don't think I've ever been knocked out of the animation, and I take this skill for granted way more than I should, making it a great way to both deal significant damage and prevent taking it. Because you never need to worry about dodging an attack if the attack just never happens. The extra bleed damage doesn't hurt either, it's by no means significant, and I don't think space rocks bleed anyways, but that little extra perk can really heighten the gravity of the situation. Okay, you're probably tired of all these rock buns. I just want you to know I share the sediment. Okay, now I'm done. Number 9 is the Bolt of Grand Sacks. If we were ranking weapons by design alone, I'd have no problem putting this on the very top spot. Right after fighting Godfrey's unfriendly ghost, you can head west down to where this Crucible Knight is and carefully walk off the railing to fall right down to the tip of the spear. Work your way up the shaft, giggity, and the spear should be right there in front of you. The range on its weapon art is just downright insane if you charge it up, but I'm afraid if I extend too much on it, they'll just nerf that shit too. Like, how much commentary can I get away with until I start receiving weird glances from the balancing team? I don't think they would, though. Half the ranged enemies have tactical howitzer missile attacks that you can barely dodge through anyway, so it's only fair that you get one too, right? A charged bolt from this thing can throw up damage numbers in the thousands before it's even fully upgraded, which is almost enough to compensate for it being a spear, because I always thought the movesets on spears are just boring, okay? I'm sorry, I never like them. If you're itching for a dragon cold build, this weapon absolutely just cannot be slept on. It's got a bit of a weighty dex requirement, but you find this thing pretty late into the game, so you have plenty of time to focus a build around it. Number 8, Death's Poker. I had several people threaten to stage a coup in my Discord server after hearing that the poker wasn't on my last list, and I'm totally not hyperbolizing at all for comedic effect, and they totally didn't just inquire calmly about whether or not I had found the weapon in the game yet. And it may have been, like, two people. Mind your damn business, I just met you. Well, I tried it out, and it turns out Ghost Flame Ignition might be one of my favorite new weapon arts of all time. You can get this weapon from a Death Rite bird in Kaelid somewhere around here? Sure hope I remember to put up a map. It's not the coolest looking great sword in town, it's basically a giant fire poker. Like, you can get these at Lowe's for like 20 bucks. But what highlights this weapon amongst others is the weapon art that's attached to it. It basically just summons a ball of black flame right in front of you. Light attack sets the floor on fire with damage over time, heavy attack ignites it all right in front of you in one big boy boom. Not sure if I would choose the poker over some of the arcane weapons that just joined the meta pool, but I'm doing this boss fight with a plus three if that means anything, so I'm surprised this was one of the things that didn't get nerfed. Honestly. Number seven, the Halo Scythe. Yep, it's still bullshit. Number six, the Ruins Greatsword. I'm gonna take everything I said about strength builds being given no love, and I'm just gonna eat that shit like a log trimmer. The Ruins Greatsword is a really easy weapon to miss on account of the boss fight being required to get it becoming unavailable if you trigger the Radon Festival by going to Altus. But it's basically just another big-ass space sword with space powers. The Wave of Destruction weapon skill can multi-hit on targets that are big enough, and the range is deceptively long. It is one of the nine legendary armaments, but it's also a colossal weapon, meaning you can file a 1040 in the time it takes to connect with a standard light attack, but if you don't mind everything in the game being just faster than you, the Ruin's Greatsword is proper evidence that strength builds can be just as fun to play in Elden Ring as any other. On the surface, it looks just like another giant rock sword that seems to be a dime a dozen in this game, but like pretty much any weapon, the use of the skill is what we're interested in. And slamming this thing down like you just gave someone a jail sentence really does feel like nothing else. Like, it makes you feel invincible. There aren't too many strength int weapons out there to choose from, and this is 
honestly one of the best despite its obvious drawbacks. It's one of the only weapons that actually scale all the way up to S with strength, and getting it early to mid game means it can be upgraded pretty comfortably. Number 5 is the Blasphemous Blade. I'm gonna be honest, y'all were 100% right to question why this wasn't in the first video, because Jesus Christ on goddamn roller skates, this thing is a beast. It earns a special badge for being one of the only greatsword designs that's ever made me want to vomit, but this weapon art does more fire damage than sunbathing on Satan's front porch. It's fucking awesome. And everyone was right to suggest it. Anyone who used to think Moonveil or Ice Rind was OP has obviously never cleared an entire hallway with this weapon. The scaling is pretty average across the board, with C's in strength and dex and a low B in faith, but the fact that it scales even half decently with three completely different stats makes this one of the strongest picks for any build that isn't a sorcerer. Much like the Ruins Greatsword, the Blasphemous Blade has a weapon skill with a much longer range than it looks like, and if whoever you're aiming at gets hit with the whole thing, it gets knocked on its ass and flung backwards about 20 feet in addition to a shitload of fire damage that walks the tightrope between overpowered and not. It's easily one of the strongest off-meta weapons in the whole game. I still maintain the opinion that fire and Incantations kind of got the shaft when they started building all the spells, but I can definitely see some pyromancer types enjoying this sword. And I wish I would have considered this on the last video, because it's honestly become one of my main weapons. It's pretty fun. I tried to decide between Dark Moon and the Wing of Estelle on this one, and I I just couldn't. They have a similar scaling and moveset, and I would only be tempted to give Estelle here a slight edge due to the magic projectiles from the strong attack costing a grand total of 0 FP. And even then, I still can't really decide, so you know what? Fuck the rules, I'm putting both of them in the same number 4 spot. What are you gonna do, tell me I can't? You gonna consult the middle finger and tell me how to run my shit? The Greatsword versus the Wing is a bit more of a nuanced comparison than I realized, because the first time I saw either of these weapons, my little and Brain just thought, hey, they both fire magic waves, they're basically the same thing. Charging up the weapon skill on Dark Moon takes a lot of FP, but the magic heavy attacks themselves don't use any, which is a pretty big sell. The wing doesn't take any FP at all, as it just launches magic projectiles by default, and the moveset is also much faster, but they're shorter range and have considerably less damage without any status ailment attached to it. A charged heavy from the wing fires out two projectiles instead of one, and I haven't tested this too much, but the wing might actually have more stagger potential despite it being a smaller weapon. That might be bullshit though, and the only reason I think that is because it's quicker and it just fires more stuff. They're two different weapons with two completely different sets of competencies, but I still feel like I'm gonna get shit from fellow almond brains if I don't somehow include them together because Sword Make Wave was the only thing they bothered to write down. Number 3, the Reduvia. I honestly don't have much to say about this one because I've already said everything I could in the last video. I just loved this thing before they even fixed arcane scaling, so much so that I even streamed a Deathroot charity run where this was my weapon of choice. I was taking down bosses way above my level with this thing just because of how versatile it was, and its weapon art makes it just as deadly from mid-range as it is up close. But ever since arcane scaling got a nice retooling, I've been falling in love with the Reduvia all over again. Like I said, this weapon appeared on the last video, but I don't really think it it was given the spot it deserved, and that's doubly true after the patch changed what it did. I've never been a dagger fan, honestly. Typically I go after the first greatsword and just stick with it until I find a cooler looking greatsword that eventually replaces it, but the Reduvia is one of the only daggers in the entirety of souls that I've actually given a chance and stuck with, and I have no regrets. Number 2 is the Rivers of Blood. <laughs> Holy shit. Talk about a redemption arc. This weapon was the black sheep laughingstock of the katana community not even a couple weeks ago, but it's cleaned itself up and scored an office job and now it's the one laughing and benefiting from capitalist corruption. One of the biggest drawbacks of this weapon is how late in the game you even get to it, seeing as how it resides at the Church of Repose where Okina spawns in and kicks your ass a few times possibly even more than a few times, but if you put him down you can snag his weapon and turn the rest of the game into journalist mode. At 17 FP per use, the mana cost is one of the weapon's biggest and only drawbacks for that matter, but if you have the FP for it, following up with a second and even a third input is more than worth it in fights. There's seriously no reason to even run away from anything anymore once you've upgraded this to a plus 10. So many things are weak enough to bleed damage as it is, and the weapon art is able to proc the effect every third hit or so, once again making weapon art spam the viable strategy in the long run. This weapon makes you the boss of Elden Ring, and everyone in it is merely playing your game living in your universe, and their right to life is your decision. This one might actually surprise a few of you, but my number one weapon is none other than the Queen of Staggers herself, Eleonora's Poleblade. I prefer this over Rivers of Blood for a few reasons. First and foremost, Twin Blades get almost no respect in this game, and if I'm being honest, I'm starting to think katanas get way too much. And I had the balls to leave the Halo Scythe on here, so I know that's not even the hottest take you've heard from me today. All I've heard since the patch is everyone switching their attention over from Moonvale to Rivers of Blood, and it's, it's like hearing people argue over which Transformers movie was better. Like, sure, the effects 
were kinda decent in Revenge of the Fallen, but let's not pretend your time isn't better spent broadening your taste a little. Also, the weapon art just looks cooler, in my opinion. It can stagger pretty much anything in a single use, and it's about the closest thing my fangirl ass will ever get to using a lore-accurate Rikuyo. Sometimes when I'm using Rivers of Blood, I keep a Reduvia in my offhand just so I can put it away and equip the pole blade so I can pretend I'm using the Rikuyo in a transformed mode. Rivers of Blood might be better for clearing out crowds of smaller enemies or farming Albinorix at Mogwin or something, but I personally find the pole blade stagger potential to be much more useful against bosses. It doesn't consume FP as ravenously as Rivers of Blood, and you're technically doing much more damage in one go, assuming you get a critical out of it. Okay, I'm, uh, I'm done. Bye.